Hello and welcome. Thank you for attending our Spring 2017 Carton to Garden Contest webinar, sponsored by Evergreen Packaging and KidsGardening.org. I'm Larry Keyes, the webinar moderator. This presentation is to support the Carton to Garden program to guide applicants through the process of successfully developing a Carton to Garden contest entry, regardless of space, climate, or resources that they may have currently available. As part of the Carton to Garden webinar, we have the Carton to Garden resource page at http carton to garden.com, that's two with the digit, and also a PDF handout, the Carton to Garden Indoor Growers Guide, which includes tips for establishing and sustaining your indoor garden. This is currently located in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. I'm going to be joined by a couple of colleagues, and I'm going to ask my colleague Sarah to go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Evergreen Packaging is a global carton manufacturer and a major supplier of school milk and juice cartons in the United States. Evergreen Packaging is committed to increasing carton recycling in the United States and as part of the Carton Council has increased access to carton recycling from 18% to 59% of U.S. households since 2008. Evergreen Packaging launched the Carton to Garden contest in 2015, encouraging students across the nation to repurpose their cartons after using them while at the same time teaching them about the importance of eco-friendly packaging and healthy eating in a fun and competitive way. You can find out more about Evergreen at their website, www.evergreenpackaging.com. Our second sponsor is kidsgardening.org, and kidsgardening.org has been a leading resource for school and youth gardening since 1982, providing garden grants, research, and curriculum. Kids Gardening creates opportunities for kids to learn through the garden, engaging their natural curiosity and wonder by providing inspiration, know-how, networking opportunities, and additional education resources. They provide free lesson plans, activities, grant opportunities, and curriculum. You can find more about kidsgardening.org at www.kidsgardening.org. <laughs> Let me briefly discuss our agenda. We're joined today by two of our favorite school gardening experts, Charlie Nardozzi and Sarah Pounders. After a couple of these minutes of housekeeping, they'll spend about the next 40 minutes or so giving you all the information you need to enter the Carton to Garden contest with examples and ideas from last year's winners and also an introduction to the nuts and bolts of using your curtains for indoor gardening and seed starting. After their presentation, Charlie and Sarah will answer your questions during the last part of our webinar. <clears throat> this is your chance to get your questions answered, questions that are either specific to the Carton to Garden contest or about school gardening in general. You can type your questions in at any time during the webinar. To do so, click the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel and type your questions in the box. I'd like to introduce then um, our new, um, our first panelist, Sarah Pounders. Sarah has been active in the field of youth gardening for over 20 years and has been education specialist at Kids Gardening since 2005. She's coordinated numerous children's garden programs and conducted research on the benefits of using school gardens to teach nutrition curricula. She writes curricula and activities for youth of all ages and conducts both youth education programs and teacher training sessions on integrating gardens into the classroom. Sarah also enjoys gardening at home with her two young children and serves as the volunteer garden coordinator at her daughter's elementary school. So we're going to find Sarah here. And she will join us shortly, I hope. There she is. Hi, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm good. Sorry about Excellent. that. <laughs> A little All hiccup. Right. So I'm going to jump off, and Sarah's going to continue with the rest of the presentation until uh, we also bring in Charlie and Nardozzi, who will talk about um, seed starting and so forth. So I'll um, take it away, Sarah. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're very excited to be able to share this great opportunity with you to uh, 
participate in this contest and raise some funds to either start a new or existing garden program. What we want to start with today is an audience poll just to kind of get an idea of where everyone's coming from. So if you wouldn't mind taking just a minute to select where you're from. Is it going? Yep, it's going. Okay. And it should, if you can click in, it should give us the results. There we go. Oh, and it looks like we've got a widespread, but a top it looks like northeast, southeast, and southwest. Excellent. Um, good to, to have a variety here. So I'm just going to start out. I know that if you found this webinar, you've probably already read some of the overall instructions about how the contest works, but I'm just going to kind of go through some of the details because then the rest of what we talk about today will make sense. But basically, there's three major steps in, in being part of this contest. The first is to save your empty milk and juice cartons, and those can be saved either from school or from home. Um, the second step is to creatively repurpose those to turn them into some kind of project that engages your students um, with an aspect of environmental stewardship and healthy living and have an aspect related to gardening. So it has some sort of link to gardening. You do not have to have a garden to participate, but you actually need to link to a gardening activity. And the third step is just to share your results of your project with us. So to create an online entry form and if you want to go for one of the top prizes it also includes submitting a video and we'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so and that is all due by April 12th with the award being um, announced in May. So who is eligible to apply for this project um, at this contest? Any school in the United States teaching pre-K through 12, so all grades are eligible, and that includes public, private, and charter schools may enter the contest. Um, and your students should be involved in every aspect of the project, but all the entries must actually be submitted by someone who's at least 18 uh, years of age. So although we've tried very much to keep the guidelines of this contest as flexible as possible because we want you to be able to be as creative as possible and to also have as much control over uh, what uh, it, and much creativity and making sure that it fits in with your curriculum, we ha have a few guidelines in place. One is to use at least a minimum of, minimum of 100 cartons in the project. The cartons should be a major part of the project. You can use other supporting materials, especially encouraging other repurposed materials as part of your final creation, but you need to, they should still be a major component of the project. You then um, must complete the online entry form and submit up to 10 photos. And to be eligible for the grand prizes, like I mentioned before, you, you must also submit a video. And for each photo or um, for any children that are can be identified in the video, you must submit a photo release form uh, with each of those. And our photo release form is available on the Carton to Garden website. Um, you can download it under rules and regulations or there's also under the FAQ section you can find a link to that photo release form. So there are a number of different prize categories um, for this uh, uh, for the, the contest here. Um, first is the grand prize, which everyone is shooting for, of course, it's the $5,000. Then we also have three specialty prizes because we are focusing on three different areas to, um, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, 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 as part of the goals of what we're trying to teach through this project. The first is STEM, which is the, we depict the project that uses, that has the best use of STEM technology, I mean, sorry, science, technology, engineering, and math lessons in your project. The second specialty prize is about sustainability. The pro, when we choose the project that has the best demonstration of using sustainable practices. And the third category is health and nutrition. And so that's the project that incorporates um, lesson, the best, incorporation of lessons about wellness and health and nutrition. And then there's also a second category where it's the, the age-related prizes. So all of, there's five that are specifically um, allocated for elementary school entries and another five that are specifically allocated for middle and high school entries. In addition, new this year, we will have 10 additional lucky entries and that will be folks that have not won. So anyone from the pool of those who have not won who will uh, enter a raffle to win a $50 gift card to Gardener Supply. So today what I wanted to show you is just kind of 
um, give you an overview of some of the winners from last year as part of kind of inspiration for you so that you can uh, take away maybe some of the components that they had in their project that really helped them be successful and help make a good impact on their students which is in turn how they how they receive the award each of these ones that I'm listing um, you can find a copy of their video on the Carpenter Garden website it's under the inspiration tab I highly recommend that you go through later uh, when you have more time and watch those um, but the first or the grand prize winner for 2016 was Champion Theme Middle School, which was in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And as, as their project, instead of having one big project that they focused on, they actually did a seri series of mini projects that kind of lasted all year long. Um, and I'm just going to give you an example of some of them. But they really incorporated the, the cartons, both the collecting and the projects, throughout the year in all different um, subject matter. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why it was such a, a, a really um, standout program. Some of the things that they did, for example, they planted seeds in cartons and then donated those to their local community garden. Um, they had a cool program where they um, taught children, the, the kids, how to make uh, nutritious kale-based smoothies. And then they planted kale in the cartons and then allowed the students to take those, those plants home so that they could try them at home and share with their families. And then the last one, as an example, was they actually created a special science club that delivered programs to elementary school kids. So the middle schoolers were becoming the teachers. They were learning all these principles about sustainability um, and also about plants, and then taking those to the younger children. So some things to take away from that that you might want to consider as you're devising your program. First of all, their projects were student-led. A lot of them were ideas that were straight from the students. They um, involved students throughout their school, not just a small group, but they had all their students involved. And they also involved members of their local community. Um, they addressed all of the specialty interest areas that we mentioned before. Um, and then they also, an important thing is they documented each step in their journey. So you can see that if, if you have a time to watch their uh, video, you can just see how the kids were so enthusiastic. It really became something that was um, an important part of their year. Another one of the winners, this was our 2016 sustainability winner, was Davis Bilingual Magnet School, and it was in Tucson, Arizona. And you can see their project. They had one, one main project, um, and they built a shade house by weaving cartons onto a base of PVC pipe. And um, as you can see, that is a, was an impressive structure. And then they then used, after using the structure, they used it to have different experiments about growing plants in shade versus full sun, uh, collecting data about what they found. They also used it once they had create, uh, figured out that it was very good for these smaller, younger plants to have a, a start not quite in full sun. They, um, they then used it as a way to get seedlings started and keep them from getting sunburned. Um, and also, you're going to find, once again, this was a student-inspired project. One of the students came up with the initial ideas, and then they all worked together with the teachers and the students to create the structure itself. Another neat thing about this project is that it, um, the structure actually was had a very functional purpose in the garden. Um, it was not something that was just done just to complete the project, but also something that really they needed and they can continue to use afterwards. And they also had an excellent video. Um, if you only have time to watch one video, I think this is a really good example of a video that was submitted for the, the program because they um, were able to interview the students and give you a little bit more feedback. So after you watch the video, you get a really good sense of uh, what they accomplished and how, how the students were involved. Another one of our winners from last year was, uh, and I'm sorry if you're on the line right now, I'm going to try, I think it's Kumeye Elementary School, and that's in California, and they were our 2016 STEM winner. And um, what they did is they were, used the project to address a current issue in their area that's very prevalent is that the issue of the drought in California. So they wanted to investigate that and consider alternative um, production systems. And so they created a portable wicking garden. So they were using an innovative way to water their plants. Um, and they studied different uh, ways to save water, and so this is what they came up with. And so what they were comparing is that a traditionally grown lettuce takes 15 gallons of water to grow one pound of lettuce, and then 
that what they did for their school is they grew a microgreen salad in nine days for the entire student body and using only 4.5 gallons of water. So this whole process they were talking about the benefits of using the alternative medicines, they came up with this system that they were going to use, they tested it out, and then they got to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Oops, I'm sorry about that beeping. Um, so the tips for from there that you might want to take away is first of all, once again, the students were very much in charge of directing the project and coming up with some of the ideas for what they're going to look at. They used all of the different uh, components, science, technology, engineering, and math um, to put it together. And once again, this project was uh, definitely had a practical application. Um, it, within, it fit right in with the curriculum, what they were teaching, it fit right in with local issues. Another program that was a winner from last year was Tamakas Elementary School, which was in New Jersey, and they were our 2016 Community Involvement winner. You may not have seen that, that, that was the, our third category for last year, and this year it's Health and Nutrition, um, but I, we wanted to share this one anyways because it used, um, they had a, a, a really great um, connection throughout their, uh, their, throughout their school. What they found is that they had uh, first and fifth graders got together and they found they had a butterfly garden. And the first graders were, would study the butterflies from the life cycles and the plants that they were attracted to. The fifth graders were studying the Holocaust. And one of the, um, the poems that they studied as part of their, uh, their curriculum was to study a, a poem called The Butterfly. And so they kind of started that as their spark and they went with that and totally created a program that kind of touched on all different aspects. So they had the first and fifth graders uh, linking up to be buddies and then they used the, the comparing of the two different um, parts of the curriculum. Um, they also added in things such as using, you can kind of see in the background of one of the pictures, they did poetry uh, boards using different uh, cartons and, uh, and words. Um, and they also used this to connect to historical events and they also involved um, a lot of different community members in the process. Another great video if you have time to watch it. Once again, tips for success. They had significant student involvement and they also incorporated their project, like I mentioned, throughout the curriculum. It was not just about trying to get an entry made. It was really something that um, fit right in with what they were already already doing and they were using the cartons as a tool um, rather as an, than an addition to their, um, their time. So we don't have time to go through every winner. I can guarantee you that they were all fabulous. Um, I can tell you that as I go through and share these ideas, I think to myself, I would have never come up with these ideas. So I'm so excited to look forward to see what kind of entries come this spring um, because it's always things that beyond what I could think of. So here's some additional ideas. So some additional STEM ideas first. Um, one, we had a kindergarten class that used the cartons to create living manipulatives so that they could teach the, the 10 frame concept. And they just used it in all different ways and they had plants growing in them. So really it very tied to their math math uh, curriculum. We had another program that used the cartons to study stormwater runoff to try and devise different ways to prevent stormwater runoff to uh, decrease the problems of stormwater runoff. So it was kind of a jumping off point um, in another way to devise some different experiments. And this picture that you're seeing here is a school that used the cartons to create a rainwater capturing system and then an irrigation system at the bottom. So it's capturing the, the rainwater off the roof and then distributing it over uh, their, their garden. So they were using that as an experimental, definitely engineering design. Some additional sustainability ideas. Uh, one of the schools that won last year used the carton as a way to just create a whole initiative at their school um, to try and lead to a waste-free lunch. Um, and so one of the things that they did with the cartons, and additionally, they repurposed them to create an insulated worm bin. Um, they didn't want to have the worm bin inside. This is what the picture at the bottom is. It's the insulated worm bin that they, they created using the cartons. And they, like I said, they, they created as a way, so keep the, the scraps um, and turn them into compost in the worm bin. So all about, uh, they started out by evaluating how much um, waste they were producing and then how much they were producing at the end. Um, another way was to, use, another thing that was done was to use the cartons to create a raised bed. So another practical purpose um, that they needed in their garden, a place to grow plants, um, and they used that, built that out of the cartons. Um, another thing, then, this is the picture that's at the top, is this school created a whole um, educational 
uh, display using their gardens and use this as a way to teach their their neighbors all about um, recycling and gardening um, and greening your your uh, neighborhood and finally even though this wasn't a category we also had some health and nutrition ideas from some of our 2016 winners that would kind of fit into this year's uh, main categories um, once again we some of the other schools also grew seedlings to share with their community members either families or community gardens um, and the cartons provided a great way to be able to distribute that um, we had another group that used the cartons to grow plants, which were then used in cooking demonstrations in the classroom. Um, herbs and um, lettuces especially seem to be popular um, to grow and use. Um, and finally, another uh, innovative project used the cartons to allow students to express themselves in the garden. They had had a, a, a year of, of um, experience, a lot of tragedy at their school. And so they used the cartons to um, create messages of hope that they then posted throughout the garden. Um, and so they were using Using it as more of a healing and inspiration source rather than necessarily a nutrition uh, related um, aspect of wellness and health. One of the things that we noticed throughout the, the last couple of years of doing this project is that almost all of the projects uh, have some kind of indoor gardening aspect. Not only because you, many of you need to extend your season, especially if you're in one of the areas where it's colder, uh, it's harder to get out and do a garden related project too early in the season, um, but also even those that are in, in the other climates just because of the size of the container and that kind of thing. So what we wanted to do today, in addition to giving you some ideas from some pr projects from the past, is to actually give you some real great indoor gardening tips um, so that you can help to help you be more successful with your your projects. So that's where Charlie comes in and we're excited to have Charlie today. Charlie is a, a nationally recognized garden writer, speaker, and radio and television vision personality and he has been gardening uh, for the last 25 years. My favorite thing about Charlie is that he has a great way of telling you some fairly complex gardening things in a very accessible, fun, makes it seem very simple and even as many times as I've heard him talk I can tell you that there's always something new that I learn. I always uh, have to write something additional down. So I'm excited to be able to have Charlie come on today and give us some additional tips here on how to let's show them how they can be successful great okay thank you Sarah and it's great to be here uh, with this uh, carton to garden program and the grants and it's very exciting that you can get all kinds of funds to use these cartons to make all kinds of great gardens but as Sarah was saying a lot of it starts with indoor gardening whether it be seed starting or even growing some plants to maturity indoors and I want to go through all the different aspects of indoor gardening in about 20 minutes or so uh, so to give you a basic bottom line understanding of what you're going to need to be successful indoor with your gardens, uh, whether it be with lights or soils or all those other aspects of them. So uh, first of all, we want to talk about the different types of indoor gardens. So uh, one of the easiest things to do, and if you're fortunate enough to get a grant, this is the basic one to do, is to get one of these prefabricated grow lights. These are systems like you can see here on the right, the black system sitting on top of the kitchen counter. Uh, these have a nice frame to them. They have a growing uh, base to them. They have a light ballast with lights in them. They're all really set up. Um, they have the right lights for growing plants indoors. Um, they're attractive. They're nice to have in a classroom. Of course, the downside of these is that they can be expensive. So we have to kind of weigh that, the cost of this light system versus uh, the amount of resources you have in your budget. The other way to go with having lights and growing things indoors under lights is doing a DIY system. And this would be something you put together uh, much cheaper than a prefabricated one. You go to your home center, you go to the Home Depots or the Lowe's, and you get a ballast um, where you can put some tubes in those lights and then you can hang it from a ceiling or hang it from a structure and you can grow your plants that way. The thing about growing plants indoors, especially in the winter, especially this time of year, even in places in the southeast and southwest, because I know we have a, a lot of the attendees are from those areas, is that the light levels are really not strong enough for plants to grow really well, especially seedlings. So that's why it's good to have a good light system to get them off uh, and control the temperature, the light, the humidity, and uh, increase the different plant options that you might be able to grow there indoors. The third option, of course, would be to do windowsill gardening. And this is the one that takes you back to elementary school, it takes me back to elementary school, where we put the little carton in the window and just let it grow. Of course, because of the time of year, you want to put it in the sunniest window possible, even in the south. So it would be the south or the west 
facing windows would be the best ones. But there's other things to consider. There are cooler temperatures when you put plants next to windows, so that's going to affect the growth. Growth, And you'd really want to be selective of what you're going to try to grow in that windowsill garden. I don't think you're going to really get a watermelon to do well this time of year. Um, but you might want to look at things like greens and house plants uh, that can take the low light levels. So let's kind of go through um, the different aspects of your indoor garden. So there's different considerations that you want to look at. And I just want to quickly kind of highlight these and then we'll go through each one in more detail. There'll be a different garden supplies. So again, if you have the grant, if you get the carton to garden grant and you're going to have some money to spend, you can take a look at some of these supplies and I'll highlight the ones I think are really essential and others that would be great to have but not the most important ones to have. But after that, we'll talk about water. We'll talk about the heat, which is really important for germination of seeds. Um, the light levels, we kind of touched on that. We'll go into more detail and fertilizer to keep them growing. So let's start with supplies. So with supplies, uh, you need to start with containers and get what kind of containers you'll be using. <laughs> you'll be using milk containers, juice containers, everything from pint-sized containers to quart to half-gallon to gallon-sized containers. Now the thing with the containers is certain plants want to be in certain size containers. If you're just growing a little seedling, a little radish, for example, you can grow it in a little pint-sized container, that's fine. But if you're going to try to grow something bigger, say a marigold, you might want to step up to a little bigger size container, something that's more, has an equivalent of a four-inch diameter uh, for the opening. If you're growing tomatoes, you might start with a small container, then you need to transplant into a larger container. Uh, same is true for things like eggplants or peppers. So you really have to think about the plants you're growing and the kind of containers you're going to need to step them up so that they'll grow their best. The rule of thumb generally is once your plant reaches about uh, reaches a certain height that is three times the diameter of that container. So if you have a four inch container, when your plant's up about a foot or maybe close to that, then you need to step it up to a plant a container one size larger, to a six inch container, for example. Whatever container you're using, you have to make sure it has drainage holes. That's really important because wet soil leads not only to seed rot, but to plant rot too. And if you're going to be watering, uh, you want to have some trays to catch that runoff, and you want to use a soilless potting mix. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail when we talk about fertilizing. But you don't want to just use garden soil or even just compost from the garden. You want to have a soilless potting mix that's lightweight. Seeds will germinate fast in that. The transplants will grow really quickly in it. Um, and it will have less problems with any kind of diseases, too. There are other optional things, of course, you can get. And some of these, I think, are, are more essential than others. Moisture grids are nice to keep your uh, pots kind of up a little bit higher off the bottom base. A timer we'll talk about when we talk about lights, as well as the humidity tents when we talk about watering. And spray bottles. If you can get the kids not to spray each other, they're really effective. <laughs> So water, let's talk about watering. So if you're starting from seeds, starting really basic, and you've got your, your milk carton, your juice carton, whatever it is, and you filled it with the potting soil mix, what you should do before you even put the soil in the carton is to uh, aside, take a five gallon bucket, put the soil in there and moisten it, pre-moisten the soil, then put it in the carton. The reason you want to do it that way is that by pre-moistening the soil, you're not getting into the problem of putting seeds into dry soil, and then you have the kids coming over with the watering can and just splashing water all over the place, maybe splashing seeds all out of the carton. This way, the soil is already moist, and you won't have to water again until it starts drying out. But it is important to have a consistent moisture level throughout the whole process. And so there's a number of different ways to do this. You can get, you can have Different kids assign the, the task of coming every day to check the moisture levels and, and talk about when to water and when not to water. Or you can be a little easier with it. This is especially important if you have a school where you're taking school breaks during critical times when you're growing things is having self-watering trays. These are trays that will uh, be sitting underneath your flat of seedlings that are growing and they'll have a wicking agent. They have kind of like a cheesecloth like material that will be in the water and then go underneath the pots. And what it does is it wicks water from that reservoir underneath up into that and so the water wicks into the pots so you don't have to worry about the moisture levels. It automatically will regulate itself. This is really important if you're starting seedlings and you're having long weekends or you're having school breaks in the winter where nobody will be around to do the watering. This way you'll assure that those plants will grow well. If you have a little seedling that's just starting to germinate and then even if it dries out for a day, that could kill the seedling and you'd have to start all over again. So watering is important, keeping it consistent and consider getting some of those self-watering trays. 
So for heat, that's another key uh, component of these uh, systems is to get those seeds to germinate fastest. The faster you can get a seed to germinate, the less likely it is to, to die and, and start growing and not have any kind of problems to it. Ideally, most seeds like a temperature somewhere between 60 and 80 degrees for optimal germination. That sounds pretty high, especially when you think about arugula or radishes or peas. But in fact, even though those seeds can germinate in cool temperatures, they do best at temperatures closer to 60, 70 degrees. So you could try to heat up the soil to that uh, temperature in different ways, but one of the best ways to do it, I find, and again, one of those accessories I think is, is really nice to get, and it's not that expensive, is a heating mat, a seedling heat mat. You can see a, a, a photo of it right here with those marigolds on it. What that is, it's a waterproof mat that has electrical cords running through it. You just plug it in, and it will heat up that soil to that ideal 60 to 70 degree temperature, and it'll keep it that way 24-7. So you'll see seedlings will germinate sometimes uh, soon as a couple days when it may take up to a week for them to germinate. They'll germinate really quickly and plants will grow quickly. This is actually a nice thing to have too if you're planting plants and then say you have a plant sale planned and your plants are kind of small still. They're not really up to the, the size you wanted. Put, them up, put a heating mat underneath them. You'll see they'll grow a lot faster. So that's a nice essential accessory to have to really make sure your plants are successful. The other thing you want to check with heat is the air temperature. So that the seeding mat is really talking about soil temperatures. For air temperatures, a lot of schools will have thermostats that get automatically turned down in the evening and also on the weekends and during holidays. So what normally would be a 68 degree room might be more closer to the 50s, especially if you're growing plants close to windows that might be cool outside. So keep that in mind the night and the day temperatures and how they might be different. And if those cool temperatures happen, it's going to slow down the growth. So when we talk in a little bit about water, which it might be the next slide, I think, uh, we'll be talking about humidity tents. Nope, we're talking about light first. Right. And that's another way to, <laughs> I thought I had a good segue. Uh, the, hum <laughs> the humidity tents are a nice way to keep things uh, nice and warm too, as well as humid. But let's talk a little bit about light. That's what we're going to go to next. So with light, we talked about the DIY systems where you get the, the cool white lights or the warm red lights. Those are great to have. Um, you have to create your own ballast. So I would recommend getting at least a four light bulb ballast. Get one that has at least four tubes in it. If you get one of these old fashioned uh, shop lights that have only two in them, you'll get light, but it won't be evenly distributed. You'll see a lot of leaning of your plants and legginess. So at least get a, a ballast that has four tubes in them. So when you get those, if you're trying to grow a plant to flowering or fruiting, you're going to want to have a combination of warm, cool, and, excuse me, cool, <laughs> cool white and warm red. I always get those mixed up. Cool white, warm, warm red uh, bulbs in there. <clears throat> the cool white ones is good for seedling growth. So if you're just growing seedlings, say, for about four weeks indoors, that would be fine. Then you're going to move them outside, put them in the garden or wherever. Um, but if you're trying to grow something to flower, say you're trying to grow marigolds so you can have a little plant sale in the spring and you want to have them flowering, you want to have some of those warm red because those are the light spectrum that will actually enhance the flowering of the plants. If you want to avoid this whole thing of different kinds of bulbs, just get full spectrum bulbs. And a lot of those prefabricated models we talked about have grow lights that are full spectrum that will take care of all of this. You'll see numbers like T8s and T12s. It's gotten very sophisticated. And some of these more sophisticated bulbs actually uh, save a lot of energy too. So it can reduce energy usage as well as have a better uh, plant growing underneath it. So uh, like I said, a number of bulbs, at least four of them. And you want to have the duration of those bulbs on somewhere between 14 and 16 hours a day. No one wants to come in and try to remember every day to turn it on and off. So that's why I think automatic timers are another one of those accessories, like the seed mat, that's really kind of ex uh, essential. Again, it's not a, a very expensive item, but you can set it to be on 14 hours a day and over the weekends and school vacations, you don't have to think about it. You know the lights will be on and off. And you do want to make sure they go off. You know, some people think, well, we'll just turn them on 24 hours a day. But plants like us, they need a break, they need a rest period. So you wanna make sure you don't have them on 24 hours, stick to that 14 to 16 hours. I'm guessing uh, watering is next. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, this <laughs> we'll go to nutrients. So with the soilless mixes that you have in those pots, um, the, they're really good for germinating plants. And when a plant germinates, it has all the nutrients it needs right in that little seed, and up to what we call the first set of leaves, which are called the codledon or seedling leaves. At that stage, it's using all those nutrients from the seed. 
Beyond that, it's going to need nutrients from the soil as you get into the true leaves and the plant really starts to grow. So there's a number of ways you can make sure your plants have the right fertilizer. You can get potting mixes that have fertilizer already added in it. Now, it's very convenient to do that, but I don't really like those so much because often you'll have fertilizers in there that are really high with their nutrient values and force plants to grow faster than the other conditions are there to support them. So, for example, if the lighting is not a, a, enough light or you don't have the lights down close enough to those plants so they're getting the intensity, you might get leggy plants even though the lights are on and you think you're doing everything right because they're growing so fast because of those nutrients. What I would recommend, and would be great with the kids too because it gets them more involved in it, is to have some uh, water-soluble liquid fertilizers on hand so they can be fertilizing every time that they water in a very diluted sol uh, solution. You can get chemical fertilizers to do this with or you can get organic fertilizers. So the chemical fertilizers are, are pretty obvious the ones you can find in garden centers. The organic fertilizers you have to be a little more selective about. So there are a number of different types you can use that will be water soluble. For example, there's a kelp meal, kelp being a seaweed product that has a low nitrogen but very soluble nitrogen. That's a great one to add to water to add to your plants. It gives you some micronutrients and other nutrients that plants will need. You can also do a little double duty work in the classroom if you're raising worms. Some people may be doing vermiculture where they're raising worms in the classroom and recycling a lot of the waste, whether it be food waste or paper waste. Uh, you can take some of the liquid that comes from that vermiculture container, drain it off, dilute it, and use that to actually water your plants. And it's an excellent fertilizer, has no odor to it, and the plants really love that uh, nice nitrogen, very accessible nitrogen form. Uh, you can do the same with compost tea. If you have some compost where you're doing it, you can do the same kind of process. The one you want to avoid, though, is fish emulsion. Now, I can tell you a story. <laughs> in my younger gardening horticulturist days, I was working at a place where we had an indoor garden, and I thought, oh, we'll do it organically. I'll use a little fish emulsion to keep my seedlings growing well. Well, I used a fish emulsion on a cool day when all the windows were shut, and then the smell of fish just rafted through the whole building, and I got flack for that for days, if not weeks. <laughs> So even though it may say deodorized on the container, fish emulsion is an excellent fertilizer for seedlings, but not indoor seedlings. So save that for the outdoor garden where it can dissipate into the atmosphere. I have also done that too, Charlie. <laughs> oh, I feel better now. I'm not alone. <laughs> So there are different um, common problems you might run into when you're actually growing your seedlings or your plants for that matter under lights or indoors uh, in the classroom. One of them, if you're growing plants that are um, perennial plants, plants that might be a house plant or might be an herb plant that's going to be growing you know, for a number of months if not years in the classroom, you might run into an insect called a fungus gnat. Now the fungus gnat doesn't sound good, but it actually is not a harmful uh, creature at all. It's a little black fly that you'll see is kind of flying around the plants. And if you've had house plants, you might end up having these. And what happens is that adult fly lays an egg on the soil and the egg hatches into a little grub. And it just feeds on the organic matter in the soil. It really doesn't even bother the plant. It's just found a home in your soil around the plant. The biggest problem with fungus gnats is they're a nuisance. You know, you're, you're swatting flies, and it may not be a great PR thing if your principal comes in and sees this beautiful garden and goes over and there's all these flies coming up into their face. So if you want to get rid of fungus gnats but not use any kind of harsh chemicals, a simple thing to do is put a layer of sand on top of that potting soil, a couple inch layer of sand. What that'll do is it'll break the life cycle. So the adult gnat will try to lay the egg in the sand, uh, the egg will hatch, and it'll just dry out and the little grub will die. So you will just kind of break that whole life cycle. Of course, you can also pull the plant out of that soil and get some fresh potting soil in, and then uh, compost the other potting soil. That way you'll get rid of the fungus gnats. And there's actually an organic control called natrol, G-N-A-T-R-O-L. And this is a bacteria that you would add to water and drench the soil, and it parasitizes and kills those little grubs that are in the soil. So there's a number of things you can do to keep those fungus gnats at bay. Now a bigger problem we'll have, especially when you're doing seedlings and you're starting to grow under lights or in the window, is a fungal problem called damping off. This disease is caused by a pythium or a phytophthora, which is a different types of fungus, that will actually attack this, the seedling right at the soil line. So if you look at your seedling and you see right at the soil line, it's turned like black and it just, the seedling is just kind of crumpled over. That's probably damping off disease. It's caused by usually too much water. So if you get overzealous or the kids get overzealous with the watering and the soil says too moist, 
too long, and especially if it's cool too, it doesn't have that heating mat, so it's kind of cool soil temperatures, that's the perfect environment for this disease to get going. Once it starts, it can literally wipe out a whole tray of seedlings within overnight. So when you, you have to kind of keep checking your seedlings and making sure you're thinning them properly, making sure the soil is drying out a little bit, not staying over wet. And if you see some of this damping off starting, you want to pull those seedlings out immediately so it doesn't spread to the other plants. At that point, you might be able to save some of your tray. So this is a real critical problem that you often will see with seed starting, especially when you're working with kids or, or people who don't have a lot of experience with it, with too much water. Um, and cool soil conditions. So as you see from the last number of keys here we have, uh, it's, uh, the watering is important, having clean soil, you want to start with a sterilized soilless mix, and of course pest-free plants. You know what happened in the Northeast, for those from the Northeast they might remember this a couple of years ago, a supplier of tomatoes um, who was growing them I think more in the mid-Atlantic states had a uh, late blight disease on their tomatoes and they spread said those seedlings up to all the different home centers in the Northeast. People planted those plants not knowing what was there and that year there was a devastation not only with home gardens but commercial gardeners of all this late blight disease spreading all over the place so make sure you have pest free plants to start with and the final slide we're going to talk about uh, the different kind of plant suggestions. So I kind of alluded to this a little bit uh, with the first slide that we talked about. Uh, you have low light conditions, especially if you're growing things this time of year. Now, if you're in the south, if you're in Houston, like where Sarah is, or down in Tucson or Florida, certainly within a month or so, you probably can get away with growing more things indoors just because of the light levels, especially if you have a south-facing window. But for most people, and even for those places, it's always good to start with plants that you know you're going to have success with. You want the kids to feel like, yeah, we did something and look how successful it is. And the best place to start is with greens and microgreens. Now microgreens you might have heard of and might have even seen in grocery stores with exorbitant prices for these little plants put in little baggies. <laughs> but it's really they're the simplest thing to grow. All you want to do is, and this can be kale, it can be radishes, it can be peas, it can be beans, it can be a number of different kinds of plants that you're going to put in a tray, just an open tray of soil, potting soil, and let them grow up. You'll let them form their seedling leaves, those cotyledon leaves that I told you about, and then you'll go to the mature leaf stage, which is the next set of leaves. At that set, you'll, you'll just take a scissors and just cut them right at the soil line. Throw them in salads, um, mix them up with some other kind of dishes that you have. It's a great way to get a quick crop indoors during the growing season, uh, during the winter season, uh, during the school year, so that kids can really feel the satisfaction of planting something and getting the reward of it. Some of these microgreens will be ready within a week or two. Some of them will go all the way up to uh, maybe uh, two or three weeks. That one school that Sarah mentioned, the uh, Kumaye, is that the name of it? I think it was, yeah. <laughs> I got a pronunciation right. It sounds like they use that microgreens to actually create a whole experiment and then feed the whole school with microgreens. What a cool idea, huh? Uh, so microgreens are a great way to, to have a quick reward with using greens. They're better than sprouting seeds. Some people think, well, we'll just sprout seeds in containers, but those can, because there's no soil involved and you're watering them, there's been some issues around diseases getting in those, and so you don't want to even deal with that. Go with the microgreens, they're much safer and much better. If you want to grow greens themselves, the arugula, the kale, the lettuces, the spinaches, you can grow all of those under a light system uh, pretty easily. You want to start with a cell tray like the one we see there and grow those well. Those are nice because you can pick them at any stage. You can wait till you have four leaves, six leaves, pick individual leaves, pick whole plants. Again, you're going to get a real quick reward for growing these plants and the kids will feel very satisfied. Now, if you do want to go a step further, you can grow something that's fruiting, which, as I mentioned before, needs more light, more time, and a bigger soil mass. And, of course, bush beans are the classic. I mean, who hasn't gone through science in elementary school and put a, a bush bean seed in a, a little cup and grown it in a windowsill, right? It's all part of the whole uh, science program. Uh, so growing beans are nice because they don't require a lot of care. If you can keep the lights close to them, and that's really key with a lot of these plants that you're growing as seedlings, keep the lights only a few inches above them. Uh, grow the bush beans up, you'll get some nice fruit on it, and even if you got a few beans, the kids will be thrilled that they got something out of these bean plants. Other things you can grow successfully inside would be root crops. So you can grow things like radishes, beets, carrots. They'll all grow in these containers. Now, you have to understand they are root crops, so they need a good soil mass. So if you're going to grow a carrot, for example, you want to get into one of those taller containers, maybe the half gallon or a quart size container that's a little deeper so that the carrot can go down. 
Also, you can look at some of the different varieties that are meant uh, for shallow soils, some like uh, some varieties such as Thumbelina and Little Fingers. These are short little varieties that don't need a lot of soil mass, so you get a nice crop out of them. Radishes, you can uh, grow really easily as well as beets. And the nice thing about those three root crops is that even if the root doesn't form, maybe you didn't thin it properly, maybe it was too warm for them, something happened, they didn't get much of a root, you can always eat the tops. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing that kids get excited about. You mean I can eat the carrot tops? <laughs> yes, you can cut them, they taste like carrots, put them in salads. If you want to get a little more sophisticated, herbs uh, will be a great addition. A windowsill herb garden is nice. Some of the easiest ones to grow would be parsley and chives. Uh, first of all, chives, especially if you're in the south, pretty soon you could probably be digging them out of the garden and bringing them in in containers. And they will use, cut them down once they grow up and start flowering. You can cut them back. They'll regrow again and again. Parsley likes cool conditions and can handle the low light conditions you often find in schools. So those are two nice ones to start with before you start launch, launching into the thyme and the basil and the sage and all the others. And finally, a nice plant suggestion to use would be indoor tropical plants. So this is kind of a different uh, mode to go to, not the edible mode, but something that would be nice to have around. And you can certainly grow all kinds of flowering plants um, under lights. And what's nice about them, especially things like uh, African violets and begonias and impatiens, is you don't need the light level to be right on top, the light ballast to be right on top of the plant. You can have it a couple feet above it and not be so critical of moving it to follow the plant growth. And they'll do fine. And they'll actually flower for you inside. You can do some uh, plant propagation, taking tropical plants and rooting them, do a whole school section on that. That. So there's a lot of options with tropical plants that do well in these shadier, cooler conditions indoors. So these are some ideas for growing indoors and, and hopefully make it a successful program for you. And I think Sarah's going to come back and tell us a little bit more about the grant. Yes, I am. And But before I do, let me just once again, I know Larry mentioned it, but we have a handout under the handout section that you can download. And that is, um, has information from our Grow Lab curriculum. And it has more additional details about different plants and planting techniques. And, and so if you download that and different instructions for like how many plants per pot and that kind of thing to plant. So definitely download that and check it out. So I just want to briefly mention, so we've talked about different ideas for your project and we've talked about the indoor gardening techniques. Um, in addition to the project itself and putting it together and designing it, you also need to remember that your entry form is what all of the judges get to see of your project. So however great your project is, you also have to take time to make sure to share that in a way so that the judges can see um, how wonderful your project was. Um, so I just have a few tips as you're filling out your entry form. It's an online entry form. And so as you're writing it, remember just what I call the C's, which is to make sure that you're writing clearly, try and keep it as concise as possible, um, want to make sure your creativity shows through and be creative in the, the amount of space that you have to, to fill in. Um, you want to make sure that you can you, you explain clearly why your project was compelling, why the kids really, why it was really, really well, why the kids, how the kids um, were impacted by it, how they were involved. And also another key is just to follow the criteria um, that's laid out. So, and that's also, I have that down again on the last bullet about completing all requirements. Um, so many times we'll have a great application and perhaps you just forget to answer a question or two. Well, that really impacts your score. Um, and we have a, a judging matrix that's available um, so you can see how things are judged and you can find that under, uh, download that under the rules and regulations um, section so that if you have any, um, uh, so that you can know ahead of time how, how the entries will be judged. Another key tip to keep in mind is that we highly recommend that you answer all the questions for your entry in a Word document first and then copy and paste that into the entry form. Although the, the online, we've found um, a number of people have their, it's a, the, the entry form is uh, something that you access through an internet browser and it's set up so that it should be accessible before it times out for up to an hour or uh, at least. However, we found that some people's internet um, settings in your own browser and it's a, a definitely something security related, sometimes something like that will time out much quicker, like after five minutes or so. Um, and so people will start an entry form and they'll start typing and changing and they won't have any interaction and won't submit anything for a while and then you'll lose that entry form. So definitely we highly recommend put it in a Word document then copy it and paste it into the entry form. Finally, my last tip is to find someone to proofread it, someone who's not 
directly involved if possible with your program or only knows of it um, kind of on the side because it's that way they can see uh, and make sure that you're explaining it clearly and make sure that you have uh, provided all the details that someone who's just getting their first look at it would uh, would uh, need to know. So just briefly, as you're creating your project, make sure you keep in mind some of the goals that we've talked about today. The goals of the program being we're trying to teach kids about healthy consumption, about being uh, recycling practices, repurposing practices. Um, we're trying to encourage creativity, leadership, teamwork within the kids, and of course that we have these three categories that we're looking at, which were STEM, sustainability, health, and nutrition. So keep all those in mind. And finally, just for the tips, if you are going to go after one of the specialty awards or if the grand prize, when you do your video, you are going to keep it to five minutes or less. And it's really great if you can find a way to make your project come alive. Um, interviews with students and teachers are one of the best ways for the judges to really get to see how the kids were involved and how it, how they um, what they learned, um, what the impact was. So we have additional video tips um, available to you once again on the Cartner Garden website. It is under the facts section, the FAQ section. Um, you can download that. It has additional information, not only about tips for making the video, but also about posting them um, and providing the link for us. So we'll open it up right now to, to questions that we can have. So I think Larry is going to come back on. And we've posted right here. This is the website. Like I said, there's lots of, lots of additional information on there. So one of the first questions we had was, do I have to make a video? In other words, and the answer is, is no. OK. You do not have to only the only if you're trying to go for the top award or for the specialty prizes do you have to have a video. If you're just going to go for one of the grade level awards, you do not have to have a video. Great. Okay. Just submit photos. You do have to submit photos. <laughs> <laughs> right. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we have a great question from Kendall Beal from Apple Tree Schools, a charter school in D.C. that serves pre-K. More than likely, there will be no, uh, little to no student-led initiatives, just involvement from the students. Do we have a chance to aim for any of the higher level awards, even though the ideas are not student-led? Oh, definitely. I don't, although that was a common theme in many of them, what, when each, the reason why we have all the different levels is each project will be evaluated based on uh, the student um, it, based on the students you're reaching. So your project will be based on how those where those students are at and how it fit in with your curriculum and how it fit in with those students' needs and, and what they learned. And obviously kids that are younger will learn at a different level and be, have different needs than the older students. So we look at each project based on looking at the audience, what they're learning, and how it impacts them. So. Yes. And even though it may not be student-led, you really look at the student participation, too. Are you trying right. to incorporate the kids as, as what's appropriate for their age, of course, um, but in that program? And that's really one of the key things we're looking at, too. Yes. Um, okay, we've got a couple other questions, but I also want to encourage people, if you have additional questions, put them in the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Even if we don't get to them now, we'll... Uh, provide a transcript of questions and answers um, on the website. Um, one of the questions is about something that I don't even know how to pronounce, neonicotinoid seed. Are we educating students about nicotinoids? I don't know how to say Neo that. Neonicotinoids. <laughs> neonicotinoids, yes. That is, that is an issue. Um, having a neo seeds that have neonicotinoids used on them. <laughs> I won't even try to say it anymore. Uh, it's a way to, to kind of uh, keep fungus and other kind of diseases off those seeds. Um, but there is uh, evidence out there that the neonicotinoids um, harm bees, harm butterflies, insects, et cetera, et cetera. So that certainly can be incorporated into your grant proposal or your application as far as maybe we're going to be looking at that as a way to educate students about what goes on seeds? You know, a lot of times you open a pack of seeds, you'll see that there's this pink stuff on them or there's green stuff on them, and you don't really know what is on them. And you can uh, compare and contrast organically raised seeds, which would not have any of those materials on them, with ones that are more conventionally raised. Uh, so I would suggest 
you know, it's a great topic to bring up, but it's also a great way to integrate it into whatever application you're doing uh, to have the students doing some research about it, kind of finding out what the differences are and seeing if the plants respond differently as they're growing. Do I have to have a garden to participate? And the answer is no, you do not have to have a garden. It just has to be a garden related activity. So incorporating plants and plant growth. So and then hopefully if, if the entry wins, then you will be able to get a garden afterwards. So Yeah. Well you saw that shade house in one of the slides that Sarah showed. I mean that's a, a beautiful example of a garden related activity, creating something that's good for a hot climate, helping your plants, but don't necessarily have to have the garden. Very good. And how many cartons do I need to use? You have to use at least 100, at least a minimum of 100 cartons. But it, we had a wide range. To, I, the cartons are not a, a factor. Once you've reached your minimum, a factor in, in, in winning. So if I use 4,000 cartons, that's not necessarily better than 101 cartons. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying because it all depends. <laughs> it all depends on what your project is trying to accomplish and how you're using them. So you really want to just first plan out your project, decide how many cartons you need, and then collect that many, and then also, of course, recycle all of the ones that you're not using. So uh, it's it's a great way, but but you don't have to necessarily. Uh, it's more about the project and how they're used versus the quantity. So. Okay, and then finally, um, can we use materials other than cartons? And yes, yes you can use uh, materials other than cartons. Like I mentioned, the, the cartons still need to be kind of the, the focal point of, of the, the construction, but and it's great when we see groups that use um, other recycled materials. For instance, this picture that's on the screen right now, everything that um, is in this picture that was used, they created a raised bed for their garden. Um, it's called, it was like a truck garden, and then they planted inside of it. Everything was from the trash or recycled or reused. Um, um, they didn't have to go out and purchase any supplies for it. They found a way to, to recycle everything. So that's a great, great addition to it. But yes, you can use other things other than the cartons. Okay, we've got a couple more that we don't have time for, but we'll include those in our um, materials for, that will be on the webinar. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. We hope that you learned a few things and that you enjoyed your time with us. The webinar has been recorded and will be available to you from links at the Carton to Garden and Kids Gardening websites, as will also our slide deck, our PowerPoint slide deck. Remember that the handouts for today are also in the GoToMeeting webinar, uh, I'm sorry, toolbar, and it will be posting those on the websites. On behalf of Evergreen Packaging and Kids Gardening, we want to thank you for attending our webinar. We're really looking forward to seeing your Carton to Garden projects. We're talking uh, and talking with you during the upcoming months and the next growing season. Thank you to Sarah and thank you to Charlie for participating today and thank you all for tuning in and we're looking forward to talking to you more. Bye guys. Happy gardening. Bye. <laughs> Bye.